Good afternoon and welcome back to the next session in stage two. State, that sounds funny, but um, welcome to the afternoon sessions of Diana Initiative. Um, really excited about this talk coming up. I do want to say a quick thank you to all of our track sponsors, um, INEG Learn uh, Security, Exonius, um, Google, We Hack Purple, Bridgeview, CoreLight, Juniper Networks, and MongoDB. Thank you all. We couldn't be doing this without you. Um, you make this all possible. Um, this is going to be a super fun talk. I'm really excited, so I'm going to do the intro very, very quickly. Julie Karras, um, she, I love her intro. She is using her art history degree to teach math, which, okay, I was a music major and I'm in computers, but somehow when you read it all, got into computer security via DEF CON and many other twists and turns. And now we're going to hear how she's used all of that fun stuff and brought it into a new hacker's guide to the InfoSec, InfoSec galaxy. <laughs> Julie, please take it away. Hi, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Uh, to my closet and to the new hacker's guide to the InfoSec Galaxy, or how I stopped worrying and learned to love the CTF. Um, if you notice that there's some inconsistencies in the colors and boldnesses of the text, that's because I love CTFs and challenges so much that I actually wove one through my talk. So grab a pencil and paper or whatever you have nearby if you feel like taking on a little mini challenge here. And we're going to get started. All right, so obligatory Linux joke here. Um, and as mentioned, I teach math with my art history degree. And um, I've had 17 years in the classroom, stumbled into DEF CON, didn't even know what had hit me. I just you know, went from fangirl to hobbyist to now I'm changing my career. And um, I, as I went along, used so many fun different resources to get me to where I am now, um, which is still a noob but it was enough to get me accepted to the SANS Women's Immersion Academy, which I'm gonna be starting. And um, so I'm using this resource as, um, or I'm using this talk to sort of be a resource for everybody um, who really wants to motivate yourself to learn an InfoSec without having to push yourself, okay? So we wanna motivate ourselves because face it, at the end of the day, after you've worked an entire day, possibly commuted home, possibly not during COVID, then maybe taking care of childcare things and then in dinner and then it's like eight o'clock. And as much as I love No Search Press, sometimes it is exhausting to think about opening up a book, getting out that highlighter and trying, you know, it's, it's that can be a hard way to learn. And especially if you're getting into InfoSec, or even if you're just trying to do professional development, that can be a tricky thing to do at like nine o'clock at night when you finally have some free time. So the answer to that, you know, how do you keep yourself from doing what I used to do, which is just play Skyrim all night, is you have to know your learning style. Um, and you have to make it as fun, as challenging, and as rewarding as playing Skyrim all night. So gamified learning. Um, NIST, which is the National Institute for Standards and Technology, has a working group called NICE, which is the National Initiative for Cybersecurity Education. Um, they have a strategic plan, and one of those objectives is to advocate for multidisciplinary approaches that integrate cybersecurity across varied curricula to support diverse learners from a variety of backgrounds and experiences. So one of the ways they mention, gamification. And that is why I love the CTF. So a quick table of contents. We're going to talk about are you an Alice or are you a Jill? Are you down a rabbit hole or are you learning all trades, mastering none? This learning style um, is just going to help us sort of choose some of the types of resources we might like to use and think about what will strengthen us versus um, where we need um, or what will sort of entice us and what will strengthen us as learners. Um, then, of course, we're going to talk about CTFs and why they were actually more fun than playing Breath of the Wild, which is almost heresy, but 
you know, true for me. Um, and then coding, because we all need a little bit of coding, how we're going to get our coding learning accomplished in a fun way, um, what chow sites are and some of the favorite ones that I have used and how they just sort of will sort of suck you down a fun rabbit hole. Um, and then projects and family time, things that you can do as an InfoSec learner or as someone who's developing themselves um, to just get some hands-on experience. And of course, because if you do have youngsters in the house, it's nice to have a little bit of stuff that you can do with them while you're still learning so that you don't feel like you're completely neglecting them because that CTF was so fun. All right, so here we have two oddly specific scenarios. We have Alice down her rabbit hole. So if you are an Alice type of person, when it is time to learn, you open up YouTube, choose a networking video by Professor Messer, which if you don't know Professor Messer, do check him out. He's awesome. And you know, whenever he mentions something you don't understand, you're like, what is that? I, I have to look that up. I can't proceed until I know all about this thing. And then four hours later, you could write like a dissertation on the thing, but then you never finish the video and sort of cons like continued outside of the concept, like to the end of the concept. On the other hand, you might be Jill of all trades, master of none. And when it's time for you to learn, you open up YouTube, you choose a video, but oh, that's a sparkly. And I would like to know how to count in binary on my fingers. And, and you know, then it, it just, you know, spirals into one thing to the next thing to the next thing. And four hours later, you know, lots of really cool things on a really surface level, but you don't really know how they relate to each other. So, um, you know, most people fall on a scale from one side to the other. You have Jill's, Alice's, Jalice's, LL's. Um, but if you relate more to being an Alice, you're probably more of a deep dive specialist. Um, you might be the type of person who's unsatisfied with cursory knowledge, right? You need to know how it works. It's not enough to just know the acronym and kind of go, okay, file that away for later. Like, why is it called fiber channel if it doesn't have to run over fiber? You know, you have to know these things. Um, you might be the type of person who can pick a topic and really stick with it until mastery. Um, you might be enticed by one deep immersive task. Like today, I could not pull myself away from one really hard CTF question, even though I knew I could probably go and do the easier ones, but I wanted to get the... And the only problem with that is you might go too deep into unimportant topics you might spend too much time on only one thing. Well, I was deep today into one question on the CTF. My friend was like, pew, 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 like getting all the answers because she was doing more stuff. Um, you might need to broaden your focus as an Alice. You know, you might be really focused on one thing. Now, the world needs specialists. So as you go into your InfoSec career, that might be an advantage and might be something you want to go for. Just be really good at Azure or something like that. Um, but, you know, as a learner, you don't really know where you're going to go. So you kind of might want to broaden your focus a little bit. Um, if you're a Jill of all trades, master of none, you're more of a broad generalist. And that's actually a good thing. Um, there's some research that's been done, and gosh, it's not on the tip of my tongue right now, that shows that generalists are incredibly useful, and we kind of need more of them. We need somebody who can step in, fiddle around a bit, and go, I'm not sure how that worked, but uh, oh, I fixed it. OK, we need those people. Um, and you are the person who knows a little bit about a lot of things. You're curious about everything. Like there's no topic that you're like, and eh, that sounds boring. Like, Ooh, that sounds cool. Tell me more. Um, you're very enticed by variety. Um, and you can skim topics and learn quite a bit, just enough to be dangerous. Um, but you may spend too little time on these topics so that you don't get that deep underlying knowledge. You have a general idea of it, maybe a couple tricks, but you don't have that deep knowledge. So you, as opposed to an Alice who needs to broaden her focus, might need to narrow your focus more frequently. So why do we talk about this? Because the resources that we're going to be talking about especially specifically like CTFified learning resources um, will play to your strengths. Some of them you're going to want to use them because they'll play to your strengths. And some of them you're going to want to use them because they will strengthen your weaknesses. So capture the flag um, is gamified learning for diverse learners. Um, 
just in case you are here and still don't know what a CTF is, which is fine because it might not be your thing, or you've heard it and have never really tried one, it's, you know, a digital competition for InfoSec professionals where we all go hunting a flag, which is just a little text string, and usually there's some fancy curly brackets around it, and it's often written in Leet speak. And, um, it's buried inside various machines in different places. And the goal, of course, is to test your information security knowledge to see if you can uncover these flags. And as you uncover them, you learn about how things are built and how to take things apart. Um, so a lot of CTFs, like for example, the one we have running today, I think there are like four CTFs running today at TDI, which is awesome. Um, there's a time limit and you're trying to get as many points as you can because every time you get a flag you get more points and um they can be really competitive like some of these people get into teams and stay up all night it's like a hackathon and that can really turn some people off the competitive nature of it um so these are not that um these are resources that are ctf style uh learning resources there's no time limits there's no pressure, learn at your own pace. In fact, some of them have complete write-ups online. We'll talk about that so that you can do your learning. So if you are a Jill, why are CTFs good for you? If you, you know, identify as Jill, you are gonna love the variety. CTFs require you to have lots of different skills, um, but you are gonna need to do a little bit deeper research to really advance quick, like as far as you want to in a CTF. And Alice, it's good for y'all because it pushes you to do things in a variety of topics. You can't just stick to OSINT and just do OSINT. You have to, if you want to pr push yourself, you're going to have like to progress in the CTF. You're going to need to do lots of different topics. So on the bright side, as you do that, just like Jill's going to need to do, you get to go down your little rabbit holes along the way. So we're going to talk about TriHackMe, which has been talked about a lot today. I, I'm happy to see there's tons of TriHackMe stuff. Um, Pico CTF, Over the Wire, and the SANS Holiday Hack Challenge. So TriHackMe, again, I'm going to kind of go over this quickly. Um, it is the platform actually being used for TDI's uh, official CTF um, right now. Um, TriHackMe can get you like the joke I've had is like Shit's Creek level self-improvement, like going from absolutely nothing to really using some powerful tools and actually, you know, hacking some boxes. Um, it's a CTF style educational platform and they have hundreds of rooms. You probably heard that term. If you've never seen Try Hack Me, I'm going to show you kind of what a room looks like. Um, and for free, you have two hours per day on their VMs for free. Um, you can also use your own VM and, um, you know, connect with them and then you don't have to worry about the time limit. Um, and one of the great things about TriHackMe is they have these curated learning paths. And I'm going to show you here. Look at that. All these different learning paths that you can take starting from right in the middle, complete beginner. And whoops, apparently I knocked out my, starting from complete beginner. Start my presentation again. Okay. Um, and that's really going to take you from this is a computer all the way up through, like, I mean, really being ready to start something like cyber defense or offensive pen testing, right? Um, web application security is in your complete beginner, you know, scripting, all kinds of amazing skills. So um, that is going to be great. For Jills, if you're a Jill and you like to just kind of go everywhere and don't know what to do because there's so much stuff out there and everything's fun, awesome. This will keep you focused. Once you do this, go on to the next thing. It's a curriculum. Um, and for Alice, that's going to play to your strengths. You're going to love these deep dives. Um, lots of resources for when you get stuck. They have all kinds of write-ups and things online. Um, some of the early rooms even have a video walkthrough for if you get super stuck, which is actually come in handy for me before. And here we have, instead of a curriculum, just a whole bunch of rooms. Um, and you can see at the bottom here, like there are, I'm on page 13. There's no end in sight here. People are adding rooms all the time. There are so many rooms. And look at, look at some of the stuff you've got. 
cross-site scripting, and it's an easy room. They're going to understand how it occurs, how to exploit it. They're going to teach you how to do that exploit. So if you're interested in red teaming, or if you're a blue teamer who needs to know how to defend against such a thing, there it is, the hacker methodology, a whole room on the hacker methodology. Love it. Um, so, so many topics. Um, and again, um, Alice, you can just follow all the topics on one thing all the way down your rabbit hole. And Jill, you can dilly dally around, but you know, recommend sticking to that, that learning uh, curriculum. This is what it looks like inside of one of the rooms. You can see on the right, there's a very succinct lesson, lots of nice highlighting for anything that is a command. Um, and then on the, sorry, right, I don't write and left. On the left, there's a lesson. On the right uh, is their attack box, which is their VM that you can get for two hours a day free. It's just, you know, want a Linux terminal? Here you go. You can use that Linux terminal to connect to their vulnerable machines and do anything you need to do. You can do any of their boxes from that terminal. Of course, you can make your own as well if you prefer to have your own like Kali or Parrot spun up. Um, and then after each, you know, little lesson, there's a task. And so use what you've learned, use RVM, do the task. Cool. Put the answer in. And how is this like a CTF? Because there are little flags. And so the, this, in this case, is more of a learning style room. But some of the rooms are more like once you have enough of the learning style rooms under your belt, some of them are more hacking style rooms where you really need to just find flags and enter flags, which is awesome. All right. We're going to talk about Pico CTF which one of the things I love about Pico CTF is it gives, when I get one of these challenges, right, it gives me this huge dopamine hit. Like I feel so happy. Like it's that same, like when you get that happy dance music, when Link is cooking and you know, it's going to be a really good recipe. It's like, it's even better than that. So um, it's a Jeopardy style CTF, which means that, and I'll just, again, I'll just skip forward and show you. You see those little boxes there, each of these obedient cat and wave a flag and things like that. Each of those, it's like a Jeopardy board. You get to pick your challenge, give it a try. Eh, it's not working out or it's hard or I'm stuck on it. I'm going to try something else. You can look at the levels on it. The difficulty is usually indicated by the point value, not always. Um, and it, again, is this broad range of skills that you are going to need in order to progress and you know, learn. So um, to progress in the CTF, yay, Jill's going to love it, plays to a Jill's strengths. It's going to force an Alice to broaden their learning. Um, it includes a built-in web shell, sort of like um, Try Hack Me does. I think that was open on the screen. And these are all things, web exploitation, binary exploitation, cryptography, all of these things are taught at Pico CTF. And if you're sitting there thinking, I'm a beginner, like I'm, I don't know what binary exploitation is. Binary is just a fancy Linux word for program. Still, how do we exploit it, right? <laughs> um, well, if you look at this, Pico CTF designed by Carnegie Mellon, six domains of cybersecurity for middle and high school students. It is really designed to take you from zero to 100. And now that you've seen that it's, oh, it's designed for middle school students, there's some of you going, sweet, this is exactly what I need. And there's others of you going, seems a little easy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't think so. Um, a lot of the write-ups that you'll see, and we talk about that too, there's fantastic support. A lot of the write-ups for the challenges on Pico CTF that I have seen are not in fact by high school students or even by college students, they're by professionals who are training themselves and writing up on their blog how they figured out how to exploit some of the challenges in Pico CTF. They are not easy, folks, um, that, which doesn't mean that all of them are that hard, but you can get a nice range from sufficiently challenging through nice and easy, work your way up. And here you can see there's a tab that says learn. There are tons of resources on that tab for you to learn from. And like I mentioned, all you have to do is, because these are all old CTF questions, they're not the current Pico CTF competitive questions. So they post them and you are allowed to um, do write-ups. It's a great thing to put on your blog. Um, and you can read other people's write-ups if you get totally stuck. It's great. So. 
Over the Wire is a fun one. It's really bare bones and simple. This one kind of makes me feel like I'm, you know, in Mr. Robot uh, because it's just sort of simple. It's like a console and it's Linux and you're, you know, <laughs> you're hacking. And um, it's a war game site. And a war game site just means um, it's got vulnerable machines for you to do challenges in. Um, and so this one, again, will take you from very beginner to advanced. It, you have to SSH in to the machine and you figure out, by the way, if you're going, I don't know how to do that. Uh, the first challenge is learn how to SSH into a machine. So they got you covered. And what I like about it is it, it gives you lots of hands-on with Linux. It encourages good Googling practices. If you look at you know, their support, they'll be like, oh, why don't you Google these terms? Or um, hmm, if you're not sure how to do it, look it up on the web. We all need to learn how to use Google as information security professionals or DuckDuckGo or whatever you'd like. Um, but they do have Discord and IRC communities to support you. Um, but here's a screenshot. Bandit is their lowest level one. What What is great as an educator for me, and one of the things I like about this is if the first challenge is SSH in, and then they give you the password, you log back out, you have the password for the next one, you have to SSH in using the password you just found. Then you have to do something else. You have to use the LS command or something. All right, you use the LS command, you've got the next password, you log out, log in is level three. Do something else, but each time it repeats. So each time you have to SSH in, use LS, find the next thing, okay, and then it builds. SSH in, use LS, find the next thing, find the next thing. And so it repeats, and then you just find that before you know it, you're flying and you're using these things very naturally. As a teacher, I love the way it scaffolds you into higher learning. Um, and you can see this is me feeling, feeling like Elliot on my PowerShell. All right, um, the final CTF style challenge we're gonna talk about is the SANS Holiday Hack Challenge. Um, and I like this one because I it's like an MMO crossed with a CTF. And I was a long time World of Warcraft player, but I gotta say the avatars on this one, even better than World of Warcraft. Um, they have little avatars that walk around and interact with the little world and give you little challenges that you try to solve. And these are some more advanced challenges, but some are beginner challenges and they are absolutely not impossible. Um, and as you walk around, you'll see other people as well, depending. Um, but every year they drop a new one, <laughs> like an expansion, and um, people go through and try to solve the challenge, but they leave the others up. So they're available all the time. And these there are um, 11 of them now because they go back to 2010. Um, or there's 10 of them because they haven't done the 21 yet. Yeah, there we go. Math, math teacher. Um, so they're pretty in depth. And when as a beginner, you start off, you feel pretty good. You notice some stuff, you're doing some things, completing some quests, and then you get stuck. That's okay. Because again, once someone wins the holiday hack challenge and the winner's verified, Sans announces it and then lets everyone else post their walkthroughs and their tutorials and all kinds of things. So you can find walkthroughs and tutorials and that's gonna get you what I like, you know, as a teacher, again, I always give out the answer sheets to homework assignments because if you're stuck, you need to know how to reverse engineer that answer. <laughs> and so if you're stuck, and you're not gonna get anywhere without help. And so then as you're watching someone else do it and walk you through it, you're getting all these new amazing, you know, skills and tricks and all this new knowledge. So it's totally worth trying it on your own till you get stuck looking up the answers, taking notes on what you can do. And then who knows, maybe you use that for the next holiday hack challenge. You use some of the tricks you learned. Um, Here's a screenshot of it. Like I said, that's me, Hyper Sparkle. And uh, yeah, you know, the avatars, better than World of Warcraft, right? What did I tell you? Um, and as you look around, uh, you can walk your avatar around. Amazing animation, it goes. And as you look around, these people are NPCs. You talk to them, they give you challenges. Um, you interact with objects, they give you challenges. Uh, there's some chat over here for people who want to talk to each other, and there's a Discord. Um, for example, clicking on this picture of Santa, there's a challenge in there and there's stuff hidden in the picture. And that's gonna to apply to some other challenge somewhere else. And so it's this big, it's sort of just a gigantic puzzle game with you know information security forward challenges. 
very awesome. So, you know, just talking in general about CTFs, they are not just for, you know, people who want to get a black badge at DEF CON. They're an, like, these resources are amazing ways to give yourself a challenge, feel accomplished as you go along, um, and learn so, so much. Whether you are, you know, a Jill of all trades who needs to focus a little more on one thing, some of these resources are going to keep you more focused. And whether you're an Alice down your rabbit hole and you really need to look at more than just your rabbit hole, both of those, all of those things offer either a broadening or a narrowing of focus that you're going to need. All right, let's talk about coding before we head on, like just, just a little bit of coding before we go into child sites and before we go into projects and family time. Why are we talking about coding? We're not becoming devs, we're becoming information security professionals. I think anytime you're working with computers, it's probably good to know a little bit about coding. <laughs> That's what they run on. They run on code. And of course, depending on the field you get into, um, scripting, I mean, that is listed all over every single resume request, not resume request, every single, you know, job posting I've ever seen. Um, if you're reverse engineering, of course, you really need to know software, DevSecOps, malware analysis, web exploitation, got to know some of that JavaScript. So um, it's good to have just sort of even, I'm not trying to, you know, gatekeep with this. I know that there are absolutely infosec roles that don't need coding. Um, but it is good to know. And if you're feeling like you need to juice up your coding skills, here are some ways you can do that. Now, if you um, feel like you're an Alice type of person, you may prefer some actual college classes. Um, these four classes here that I've posted are free online, completely free. And what they do, of course, is they give you very high level, very quality instruction homework assignments that actually, because they're on these online platforms, are able to be graded. And, um, you know, feedback, evaluation, a community to work with. It's like taking a college class. Um, Coursera uh, works with Princeton University to offer computer science, um, two different ones. Uh, that class made me cry, but boy, did it get me good at Java. Um, that one's Java. The Harvard one is, I believe, C and that's on edX, and then Georgia Tech has a Python one that's excellent. Um, and so if you really wanna put yourself through it, um, these are fun classes, they're very, very worthwhile. On the other hand, we were talking about gamification, weren't we? Those weren't really gamified, it's just that I know some people prefer that route. Um, if you're agile, you might prefer something a little more open-ended. Starting off, if you've never coded in your life before with Scratch, um, it was created, um, by MIT to get young people coding, but then it sort of has gone far beyond it. In fact, the Harvard CS50 class that I linked to um, on the previous page uses Scratch to teach computer science principles. Um, it's drag and drop code blocks and it's fun. And actually I'm gonna go, you're gonna see quick demos of each of these in a minute. Um, so I'm not gonna go too into depth. Code combat is after you're sort of done with Scratch, you might be ready to, instead of drag and drop your code, you might be ready to actually type your code. Um, and code combat is that sort of um, push uh, to get out of just drag and dropping. And uh, if a lot of times thinking about coding makes you sad, then well, Code Combat is completely like a top-down RPG. It's a video game. Um, Code Academy is the more like once you've got some, your legs underneath you with Scratch and Code Combat and you really wanna just like, hey, I need to learn some pure Python and do it in a more you know applicable context code academy has tons of different languages and is the more sort of adult version of this um and we're going to see quick demos of them if my demos are working well here all right oh wait i need to pause because hold on i need to make sure that i am sharing my hold on one second Ooh, my AV person might ding me for this. I need to make sure that I'm sharing my um, sound. There we go. Sorry for that. All right, here we go. Not, not just, just for kids. kids. 
I'm going to show you a brief program and how a platform works, and then we're going to see how far it can take you in the right hands, creating fully realized arcade-style games and beyond. So here we have two what they call sprites, and my goal for this program is I'm going to have the cat walk around, and if it runs into the bear, it's going to scream, ah, and if it is walking around and it doesn't hit it, the bear is going to say, hello, world. So to start with over here, you can see all of our little code blocks, all those little functions that are built in for us. And we're going to start with an event. The event is when this gets clicked. When the screen flag gets clicked, we want the cat to continue to walk around. So under control, we're going to put what's called a forever block. It's a loop. All right. So forever, we want the cat, here's motion, to glide one second to random position. And now if it lands somewhere where it's touching the bear, hmm, okay, so we need a conditional. Over here under controls, we also have conditionals. So if something happens, well, what is happening? We want it to touch the bear. If touching, and this says mouse pointer, but I'm going to use the drop down menu to say, if touching the bear, we're going to say, Ah, or one second. And otherwise, we're just going to say hello world. Come on, fit in there. There you go. Say hello world. All right, we're going to play it and let's see what happens around, says hello world, ah, touch the bear, hello world, ah, touch the bear, okay, you get the idea, very basic program, took me three seconds to throw together, where does this lead you, well, depending on how ambitious or creative you want to be, here is a scratcher who has designed an entire, make it large so we can see, video game experience called Koi Pond. All right, it even has a soundtrack, I'm going to need that. Here we go, start, and look at this. This is all something that you can learn from a tutorial. Flying around and, oh, I died. So it keeps score, has your best, your worst. It even has how to play, all right? So um, Scratch is a wide open playground. Start with the basics, build into very impressive video games. Great way to learn to code. All right, talking code for combat. Code Combat is a learning platform that plays like a video game. Usually in a video game, you would be pushing buttons or using your controller to move your character around to complete scenarios and win the game, fight the monsters. In this case, the monsters know what they're doing. They have programmed AI, just like in a regular video game, but you have to program your hero to do the things it needs to do to win each level. So here we have um, an early level uh, programming in JavaScript. Um, this platform supports JavaScript, Python, um, C++ if you subscribed, and CoffeeScript. And it also has uh, HTML. You have some, we have some levels where it teaches you HTML web development and game development. But at the moment, you're looking at an early level, and it's trying to teach you, as you see over here, there's a level set, and it's trying to teach you a very succinct lesson. Okay, instead of just using a method, you can use an argument to the method. There we go. We can say the hero moves right two, not just once. So over here, here are your methods. It's showing you where you need to go. You got to use five lines of code or less. And they already gave you a little starter. They moved her ahead three. And we're going to start again. Now we have to avoid this monster over here. So let's see. It auto fills for you if you'd like. Two hours later. Anyway, you guys get the ideas. So there it is. All 
Run you can code. see it move down to each line as it. And then you're going to see if you make it out alive. Yep, that got blown up. This is a very simple level. Some of the more advanced levels, and we made our goals. Then it gives you a little dopamine hit, lets you earn prizes. Um, you get bonuses for clean code, that kind of thing. Um, and this is sort of what the setup looks like once you finish a level. You can see I've just finished a couple levels to show you some of the deeper levels, deeper levels in. Um, and then look at that. All through here, all these different things are levels. They will give you a lesson, and then they will have you practice and give you a lesson and have you practice. Um, you can choose different heroes. They're nice and diverse, and the first four are free, and then you, of course, can pay for extra. And oh, and in that as well, you can see where you choose your language. At any time you feel like choosing your language, you can go ahead and do that. So you can see that this is where you start, and they're teaching syntax methods, parameters, strings, loops, variables. And then once you finish this, you unlock the other content. So teaching if else, Boolean logic, relational operators, functions, object properties, event handling, you can read it. There's lots of different levels, 98, 110, 46. So it's a really fun platform to really get you started coding if you're done with Scratch and maybe you just want to start typing some stuff and it just focuses on problem solving and in the process of problem solving to win your levels, you're also learning to code. All right, and finally, Code Academy. Code Academy is a simple and effective way to get your code learning done. They have many languages. Um, currently, what you're looking at here is me trying to teach myself JavaScript. They have a lesson, a code editor, and a terminal on the screen. And you can see there's a short lesson. This one's on ternary operators. Blah, blah, blah. When you look at the lesson, very short, very digestible. Then they give you a task. Refactor or edit the first if else block to use a ternary operator. Here's where we probably go into best motion. <laughs> Now that we have that done, I've edited it, we can hit run and see if it worked. Correct, I love that. Okay, and if you look here, look, ta-da, little green check mark, I have succeeded in this task. Not only that, look down here, four days left to meet your weekly target. So it keeps you motivated, keeps you on track. You can set goals for yourself. How many times a week do you want to code? Um, and then it gives you the next task. Very simple, very elegant, very effective. All right. So however you want to get your coding learning done, these are fun ways to get yourself motivated to code. Um, choose one or all. There are so many different things you can do, and they're very comprehensive. Um, here we're going to start talking about crypto challenges and chow sites. Chow, of course, is just slang for challenge. <laughs> um, and what you're looking at here is a screenshot of um, our how to hack their complete list of war games. If you want to find this page yourself, you just Google our how to hack complete list of war games. There are so many of them here. This, if I were able to scroll down a screenshot, you would just see, just keep going and going and going. Um, and what are they? Well, they are websites created by the community um, and by just, you know, clubs and groups and things designed as fun ways to learn some of these info set concepts. They're almost a little bit like static CTFs. Um, some types of these sites present puzzles and more CTF style challenges, while others of these sites are more like, I'm going to give you some vulnerable machines and you try and hack into them. Um, again, notice the little warning here, Jills. Get a hold of yourselves. There's so much stuff there. You've got to just maybe just stick to the four that I recommend here. Um, so the crypto challenges that I recommend for Jill or Alice, um, for Jill, you might like rank.org and newbiecontest.org. Rank.org has all kinds of diverse level challenges. You have to get a certain number of challenges right to get to the next level. The, ch the challenges themselves level up, get a certain number, get to the next level. It's all Egyptian themed, it's kind of fun. Um, and the kinds of challenges that you see on there are really, like everything from just pure mathematics to 
um, web exploitation to regex, Python. I mean, just just every info security skill you could think of. Um, NewbieContest.org is in French, but it isn't a problem. Ce n'est pas un problème with Google Translate. And as long as you understand that when you're looking for the, uh, they, they call it passwords, the le password. Yeah, in French, le password or le mot de passe. There you go. Now you can use newbie contest. Thanks, Google Translate. Um, real similar setup to rank.org um, and covering a lot of the topics that you would see in something like Pico CTF. Uh, not prawn is an Alice type of experience. If you haven't done it, it bills itself as the hardest riddle available on the internet. It's been around for a long time. Um, and it starts out real easy and it starts out with more like puzzles. Um, you know, learning different, you know, classic cryptographies and then just, you know, puzzles of, you know, battle of wits kind of things. And then it progresses into web exploitation. Like at a certain point, they say, from now on, all the puzzles need to be solved by looking at the um, source code. So it's a great resource to dive down a rabbit hole. It's got this incredibly creepy ambiance and there's not really a story behind it, but it's, it's atmospheric and it's really fun. Um, and then also for our LSLs out there who just like a really deep dive, we have the US Cybercom Valentine's Day Crypto Challenges, sort of like SANS does the holiday hack. US Cybercom releases cryptography challenges and they range from fairly easy to ridiculous. Have to write, um, you have to use MATLAB or write a Python or Java program to solve them kind of challenges. Um, and they are like, talk about deep dive, so fun. Um, the thing about these challenges is unlike some of the other resources that I have shown you, you might not be able to find the answers as easily. Some of them are, um, really try very hard and ask their users not to publish things because they don't like rank.org people earn their rank. And so they don't want people just reading the answer and putting it in. Um, so you really do have to, this is, this is where you don't have the answer key. You have to work with your friends or do your own research. And so it makes it really meaningful when you solve one of these because you have not had any hints. It's just, wow, you figured it out. It feels so good. Um, here's challenge examples from Alice's side of the screen. We have on the, that is my left, um, not prawn. And you can see from the picture, it's really, um, you know, there's a skull and is that a syringe of fake blood and, you know, there's there's interesting puzzle like things going on here. I do not know what's going on here because I haven't got to level 21 on not prawn. I just nabbed this screenshot off the internet, but I guarantee there's like five levels to this puzzle. Very fun. Um, and on the other side, on the right here, we have one of the Valentine's Day crypto challenges actually from 2021. I think this is puzzle number one. That, ladies and gentlemen, is a binary cross stitch. They don't tell you that you have to figure that out but um talk about good learning like i'm a math teacher i understand base two and binary but like i learned binary doing this and so did my nine-year-old incidentally because i needed someone who could keep their finger on the screen at the last place that i had recorded a one or a zero and we started doing it together and then you know started learning about the 64th place and you know before you knew it we were both just chugging through that binary <laughs> and then you know converting it to uh words and things like that to solve the puzzle so very very fun cool types of challenges that's that's one of the easier ones some of the other ones are multi-step um so here are some examples from rank.org and newbie contest on the left we have uh rank.org i haven't solved this puzzle either i just it was a great graphic. I just took it from their site. It's one of the ones I'm still working on. Something about it probably has to do with colors. Something about the name is something about the colors. So I'm thinking I'm going to have to use like a color picker to figure out which one of those letters has like a, a hex color that's like slightly different. And that's going to give me the answer. I'm not sure. Um, and then uh, newbie contest over there, you can see Le Francais again. Le password. The password A, there you go. So <laughs> uh, don't need to know French to do newbie contest. This was just a file that no explanation, find the password. Pop that into a hex editor, lo and behold. So you're learning to use the tools you've got to try to find hidden content and find the places that data is stored. And again, goes from beginner all the way up to more challenging. All right, so let's talk about projects because they are 
real important, especially down there, even though I didn't put it all the way to the left, the way we read your blog. Um, blogs are super important for anyone who, like me, does not have a technical resume. Um, I've been in the classroom for 17 years, so how does anyone know what I can do? Well, a tech blog. Uh, you can write about write-ups of CTFs. You can do write-ups of crypto challenges. I have some of those on there. Uh, you can do a learning summary. Like, let's say you really understand subnetting and you want to explain it to people. Um, and you know, it's just a great resource and then you can put it on your resume and people can go and look and say, oh, look, they take the time, they do the tech there. You can, it's a great way to show people how you think. Um, coding projects, which also, by the way, can be put on your blog. Um, just some, there's so many coding, like if you just Google newbie coding projects, there are so many out there, so many ideas. For example, write a program that translates plain text into simple encodings. And it depends on, you know, the simple encodings can get more complex mathematically the longer you go, um, or you know a basic one, write a calculator, and then get more complex as you go. And then these projects are something you can share. Um, when I say home lab, I don't mean in the middle of this chip shortage to go buy yourself a server off of some government auction site and then like try and nope, just VMware or you know other other hypervisor of your choice. Um, and then set up some vulnerable machines on VulnHub and try to hack them, you know, uh, practice networking. So great, great project for you to have and something you can talk about in an interview. Um, and a Raspberry Pi hole is one of my perfectly favorite, perfect projects because it blocks all the ads, all the ads. I surf my, my phone, like the web on my phone and I don't have any ads. Hmm. So it teaches you how to, um, you know, set up a DNS server in your house and it helps you work with your own network, your own home network, and it's really fun. And then of course you have to tweak it and troubleshooting is all part of the plan. So great learning projects, things to get under your belt. Let's talk family time. Um, if you are an Alice, you, or sorry, a Jill, Jill of all trades there, you might love doing Scratch, Scratch Junior, or even Code Combat. Um, with your kids. And I don't just mean like little kids, although I do also mean little kids because Scratch Junior is designed for pre-K. You know, kids who can't read yet can do Scratch Junior and it is free. Um, so fun to collaborate with them and work together on projects. And then you're doing your learning and they're gonna be like, why don't we do this? And you'd like never would have thought of doing that. And now you have to solve this problem of how do we do a program that does that? It's great. Kids are great impossible idea generators. Um, if you are an Alice, you might like a crypto treasure hunt, or if you have Alice's in your house, um, where you write out, you just like, I don't know, hide random couple pieces of chocolate around the house and then write out something in code and then hide the next clue and the next clue and so forth. You're practicing some of your cryptography and they're practicing cryptography and everybody's having fun because in the end there's chocolate. Um, and then if you have, whoever you are, a middle through high school student in your house, your middle through high school student is allowed to sign up for Cyber Start America for free. It is run by SANS. It is a platform that teaches hacking in a way that is super gamified, fun art, fun scenarios, um, and because it's SANS, you know it's excellent. It's kind of like Net Wars Junior, but with like better art. I don't even know how to describe it. It's amazing. And of course, if you have someone in your house that is that age, you can work on it together. Uh -huh. All right, wrong way. So anyway, this is the grand resource list. Um, I am going to be posting these slides on my blog at the end so that, um, you know, obviously nobody can write that fast. If you're interested, I hope that you use this as a resource. I hope that you, if you know, you got some of the information from my challenge and you're kind of into it, that you go look at my blog and finish up the challenge. If you do, I have several copies of Backdoors and Breaches that I will absolutely send you a copy if you have not already got one. Um, if you send me a screenshot of the final screen in my challenge. And again, I'm putting stuff up. I'd like to, you know, have this resource there for you to use as you train yourself. So it's up there. If you know somebody who's trying to get into InfoSec, if you're trying to get young people into InfoSec, this is a resource for you. I hope that we all have fun. I, you know, 
let's get more people into InfoSec. Thank you. Wait. The end. <laughs> I'm coming. I'm coming. Hold on. Hold on. I'm posting. There it is. There it is. Um, please, please. First of all, thank you so much, Julie. That was amazing. One of the most informative talks for noobs and also for getting into all of this stuff. It was fabulous. Thank um, you. Please, everybody, I just posted the link to go fill out the survey. Um, as someone who is also a speaker, I know the value of getting surveys so we know how to improve our talks. Please take the two minutes that it won't even take that. 90 seconds to go fill out the survey for it and and show Julie some love. She did an amazing job today. And if you have any resources that you love that I would love, please do. I'm a jealous. I like all the resources. <laughs> yep. um, find her on Twitter, Eat Math mm -hmm. Love. I love that. <laughs> that is just <laughs> What can I say? That's a good life. That's a good life. It, it is. Um, and I was looking to see, I didn't see any questions pop up. I just see a lot of thanks. Um, fantastic talk. Awesome. Great talk. Applause. Pie <laughs> is amazing. Yes, it is. Um, if you want to have real fun with pie holes, set it up in a, a small Kubernetes cluster on um, Raspberry Pi's. Um, and then you can balance out all sorts of other things on there too, besides just pie hole. And it's actually pretty easy to set up, but um, I know I have one right here. <laughs> I'm writing this down. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Um, but don't use full Kubernetes. Use K3S from Rancher and it's very easy to set up. Um, what worth even, I have no idea. Gather your own. Hmm. I somebody posted something that I don't understand. What were the bolded characters? All I got was ah, some the bolded characters um, were part of the um, the crypto challenge that oh, ran oh, through yes. the presentation. Um, so if you didn't catch all of them, if I went too fast or you hopped in in the middle. Um, you know, I'm going to post the slides. Actually, I'm going to go post them right now on my blog so you can go ahead and have a look at it. It's juliecaris.com. It's like cares with an extra R. Um, and yeah, enjoy. I really hope I love making challenges and puzzles and I love doing challenges and puzzles. And so uh, if you want a free copy of Backdoors and Breaches, last time I did a talk, the, the, per, the first person that solved it was a 12 year old girl who was super into InfoSec and it was very exciting. And I sent her a copy with a bunch of stickers. I have a bunch of stickers too. You get stickers. So that is fabulous. <laughs> um, yeah. I, th this just goes to show that your major does not have to be computer science to be really good and get into this stuff. I saw mm -hmm. several other people post that they too were music majors, which I was jazz composition. What I mean, music and math. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah. So, and, and I guess, well, I'm very syncopated being a jazz drummer, so maybe that has something to do with math. Huh? <laughs> uh, anyway, thank you again. Um, we're going to kind of get set up for the next talk. Thank you all again. Here, I'll post it just in case it rolled off the screen. I'm putting it up there one more time. Um, there is the URL for the survey. Please take 90 seconds to go take care of that. I will do the same. I don't know if I'm allowed to, but hey, I'm going to. It's all anonymous anyway. Uh, have a fantastic rest of the day. And if you're hanging around here at stage two, um, uh, RT uh, Gadia is going to be doing a great talk coming up right after this. And I'll introduce that in just a little bit. Thank you again, Julie. Have a great rest of your Thank afternoon. Thank you so much.